Awesome. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for joining the Energy and Environmental Law Society and the Energy, Environment, and Land Use Program for our talk about animal property rights with Professor Karen Bradshaw. We're so excited to have her here. Professor Bradshaw is an environmental law professor at Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. She researches governance of natural resources with an emphasis on emerging regulatory approaches, including certification re regimes, public-private partnerships, and collaborative settlements. She's an expert on wildlife law and has also written about land development and forest management. Professor Bradshaw received her JD with honors from the University of Chicago Law School, where she was a Tony Patino Fellow, Olin Fellow, and common editor for the University of Chicago Law Review. She clerked for Judge E. Grady Jolly of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Before joining the College of Law faculty, Professor Bradshaw was the inaugural Coke Searle Cirr <laughs> Fellow at, of, in Legal Studies at uh, NYU School of Law. Everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for having me. Uh, one of my favorite groups to present to is students on all environmental and law issues or animal law issues. And the reason why is because it's you who's going to do the important work in the future, right? Whether you practice full time in an animal related area, which is becoming an increasingly large field, I've been happy to learn in the last few years, or if it's something that you're merely interested in or do pro bono work in the future, I think one of the remarkable things about animal law for me, which is a relatively new area of study, is how much I've learned from my students. So just to give one example, um, I was a visiting scholar last fall, and one of the institutional norms of where I was visiting is that the faculty members brought the students to lunch throughout the semester in small group lunches. And it's funny because I'm writing this book now on the new animal rights is what it's titled. I'll tell you about the content in today's talk. But every day I would go to lunch with a group of students who were ordering vegetarian entrees. And I eat meat. I feel like it's important to acknowledge that given what I'm working on, preferably ethically sourced, et cetera. But at the same time, it was striking to me and forced me to confront the ethical choices surrounding that on a regular basis because so many of the students were vegan or vegetarian. And so one of the interesting things about the animal law movement, and this is a small example of the much broader movement, is that it's being led by the new generation, right? And particularly as lawyers and law students, I see that being very much the case. Something I was talking about with Professor Rule uh, uh, prior to this um, conversation or prior to this presentation was um, when students are passionate about issues coming into law school and they want to contribute as students in some way to a field that they care about, it's very hard in a field like environmental law where many professors have built careers on various substantive areas for a student note to add um, something new to the conversation or chart a different path. But in a field like animal law or food law, which is a relatively new field, what students say matter tremendously. There are so few articles on sort of different aspects of the field that need great exploration, that the voices that come through through student note or student editorship through law reviews matters tremendously. So this is a place where you personally can make a huge impact um, if that's something that you care to do. We recently had our first Animal Law Society meeting at ASU and there were 80 students in a packed room. So unbelievable, the disconnect to some degree generationally about how this matters. It's not incidental that I waited until after tenure to start writing this book and doing this project, right? And more senior colleagues can see animal law in a gendered way as a soft field. You sort of get this pushback implicitly on the subject area as if it's you know, kittens and ponies and not taking things seriously. And one of the things I respect very much about my students is that they do take this seriously. So let's start with some statistics about why we should care about animal law as a field. Why does it matter? And certainly there have been many people, particularly practitioners, who've worked very ardently in this area for a long time. And first I'll say the failure, but then some of the successes. Uh, so I recently read a study about biomass on Earth. A number of researchers worked collaboratively in an interdisciplinary team to create a study of sort of how much different things on Earth weigh, sort of what comprised the biomass of Earth. And they found, 
they found that um, of all of the mammals on Earth, 4% of mammals are wildlife, and 96% are humans or human-owned livestock. So 4% of the mammals on Earth are wildlife. I have to admit that was such a shocking statistic. I closed my computer and was done for the day when I read it. Right? It was just absolutely mind-blowing, in part because I have a four-year-old daughter. And it seems like every book on her very full bookshelf is about animals. We tell this story to our children. We tell this story to ourselves about our national identity, about our place in the world, that we're part of a rich ecosystem. We have images like the bald eagle or the mustang on the range. But the truth about animals' place in society and American society is a much more stark picture than the story that I've been telling my child. And I think that many of us assume is the case. And there are many, many reasons why that's true. Um, but the sort of short story here, the really unfortunate thing, is that biodiversity loss is happening. It's happening at a rapid pace. There are species going extinct, et cetera. And I'm certainly not a scientist. I'm drawing on their work when I cite some of the statistics in the field. But I can say, looking at it as an outside researcher, it's been shocking and disheartening. So I started with the bad news. Now that I've depressed you, <laughs> let me turn to some of the more optimistic things. So the first I've already said, right, which is that young people, the new American generation, care about animals in an unprecedented way. And that empathy and connection to animals, uh, that desire to change social norms returning regarding animals, I think will be the saving grace in wildlife in America. Um, and I hope that that bears out in our lifetime. Uh, the second thing to note is that social norms are shifting tremendously. I was at a conference at University of Denver on animal law last year, and one of the speakers said um, that there are more vegans in America today than hunters, which shocked me. I, I wasn't familiar with that statistic. It really took me aback. Um, and this is in no way to villainize hunters or to say that veganism is the path that everyone must take, but it's a shocking social shift, something that just wasn't true generations ago. And I think it's striking how over the course of life, one lifetime, um, norms regarding the treatment of animals or the ways that we interact with them can be really, really important. Um, so hopefully there's some hope in that as well. The potential for change is certainly available, and the talent, the people who care about the change, I think is one of the most heartening aspects of this project. So let me tell you a little bit about the state of animal law as a field. It seems like there's something there should be so much information about and so much theoretical thought about. It turns out it's relatively new. So in 1970, you saw authors begin to do some really interesting things with animal law, and much of what we think of as animal law today started with their work. Prior to 1970, there were very different thoughts on animals. So in the mainstream American culture, uh, animals were thought of as property, right? They would belong to human owners who could do with them as they will. Social norms varied widely with regard to the treatment of the animals, whether one could beat animals, uh, whether one could kill healthy animals, et cetera. But the legal standards were quite low. So although social norms might have governed behavior in a particular way, the law had very few um, protections for animals. And so in the 1970s, Peter Singer and others began talking about the extent to which we needed to change the way that we were treating animals and how that could be done. And they essentially came up with the animal rights approach. So prior to 1970, if you really cared about animals, you would take an animal welfare approach. The animal welfare approach says animals are the property of humans. They're less than human but we have to take care of them because it's the morally right thing to do. So let's come up with standards for how we can treat them that seem reasonable and fair and nice. Okay, that's animal welfare. The competing camp that singers and others began in the 70s, which continues to be the front line of animal rights today, is, or I'm sorry, of animal sort of welfare, animal rights today, is the animal rights movement. And this is a very different movement. So it took a very different stance both in the conception of animals. Do we own them? Do they have independent will? Are they independent beings? But then also in the treatment of animals. And Singer and subsequent scholars focused on animals as being human-like. By saying animals are like people in certain ways, 
it then becomes inhumane in their calculation to treat animals or certain animals as less than human. So if we believe, as scientists have shown, uh, that primates are capable of incredible ranges of emotion and intellectual capabilities, if we believe, as researchers have shown, that elephants grieve their dead, then perhaps this line of animal rights thinking goes, we should afford to animals the same kind of rights that we would give to human beings. That's essentially animal rights. Now, the animal rights approach has achieved some really good things. There have been uh, several federal pieces of legislation enacted which exist to protect animals. Primarily livestock has been a source of concern. Um, but then there are also uh, major exemptions in these statutes, so things like birds don't count as animals. Things like rodents or mice don't count as animals for the purposes of protection under the law. In fact, what you've seen in the animal rights movement is incredible privileging of what we call charismatic megafauna. Charismatic megafauna are these large, uh, either majestic or cute creatures that tend to attract human sympathy. Things like whales, polar bears, panda bears, lions, etc. And so with the animal rights movement focusing on the similarities of animals and humans as the causal reason why we must protect them, many, many species on the so-called tree of life, that hierarchy of animals that arranges them in order with mankind being at the top and lesser creatures as one moves down, including things like rodents, insects, etc. There are huge swaths of animals that are essentially unprotected under current legislation. So the animal rights movement is doing work like filing habeas petitions for primates in captivity, working to have whales that are in captive facilities return to the sea or seaside facilities. So it's improving the quality of life for creatures that are high on the tree of life. The animal welfare movement, which is related, is doing things like improving the treatment of livestock. Right? So if animals are being killed for food, what are the conditions in which they're being raised or living throughout their lives? How are they being killed? Is it occurring in an ethical manner to the extent that um, one accepts that it is ethical and sort of its basis? So welfare versus rights arguments are different. Hopefully these examples illustrate how. Welfare continues to be about uh, the treatment of animals, accepting their current co social position. Animal rights tends to seek to change the social position of animals and therefore change the way in which they're treated and afford them a more full suite of rights or capabilities. Sort of the idea that they have an independent moral right to live satisfying lives. Uh, Martha Nesbaum is doing a really interesting book project on that approach. My project is a little different. So I see this debate between animal rights and animal welfare. And I think you have two groups of people who care a lot about animals, who have very different objectives and sometimes conflicting or even warring approaches, right? And in some ways that dissipates the energy that's needed for this field and it leaves many types of animals that fall outside of the concerns of either human-owned animals like the pets and livestock protected in the animal rights approach or the primates and charismatic megafauna that are the primary, although not sole, focus of the animal rights approach, so animal welfare, animal rights. You have sort of broad categories of animals that aren't in there. And I'm personally very interested in wildlife. Um, and I see or saw when looking at this literature that wildlife is essentially excluded from both the animal welfare and the animal rights approaches. This isn't to say there are no protections against wildlife or for wildlife. We have the Endangered Species Act in the United States. Uh, we have some protections there. But in general, the focus of the animal rights movement, the animal welfare movement, has been on human-owned creatures or a particular subset of wild creatures that are now being held in captivity. And to my mind, some of the most interesting and important issues are not addressed in those fields. Um, so in this project, I take a very, very different approach. It's what I like to call animal property rights. So it's thinking about the rights that animals have to land. Um, when I say land for animals, land is in fact habitat. It's the place that they need to live out in the wild. Um, and by protecting animals' right to property, I argue, you can in fact protect the animals.
This approach is interesting because it differs in a number of ways from the existing approaches. First, it's a property rights approach, so it sidesteps some of the hardest arguments that animal rights activists have had to grapple with. Namely, the comparison between humans and animals makes large segments of the population uncomfortable. Right? There is too many religious views, too many ideological views, a need for humans to be other. And with the property rights account, I don't ask people to accept that we share the same moral capabilities, etc., with animals. I'm agnostic on that point. I think that's a different conversation than what I'm trying to say. What I do say and show through scientific research, which I'll um, describe later, um, is that animals operate in our system of property. Animals have always lived in shared geographic space with one another and with humans. And the idea that we legally are separate from animals through our creation of property law is simply false. It's not well thought out in ways that I will outline in a bit. Um, it also includes sort of this interesting finding that with respect to property rights, all animals, regardless of where they fall on this so-called tree of life, have systems of property. All animals maintain territorial systems that interact between members of the species, between different kinds of species, and between humans and animals. And so my regime is no less protective of ants and honeybees than it is of lions and orcas. So by affording animals the legal right to own property, or alternatively, by acknowledging that animals already have a pre-existing right to all land, we are changing the legal status of animals. We're saying animals have a right to be here, a legally recognized right. And this sounds really radical. When I started the project, it started as a thought experiment. It's like, what would it look like if this happened? And then as I delve further into the project, I began to recognize two things. One is a practical scientific matter. Animals have always and continue to this day to operate in tandem with the human system of property, and I'll describe that in a bit. And secondly, and this was the thing that really surprised me, America has essentially, without acknowledging and perhaps even knowing what it was doing, created legal property rights for animals since the inception of this country. We have always, to some extent, granted animals functional property rights. And if we look at the many different areas of law through which Congress and the President and various states have done this over time, it's relatively remarkable that we haven't recognized that this is precisely what we're doing. And so the question then becomes, how can we or should we extend that? In the animal rights paper and part of the book project, I talk about extending legal rights to animals through either a statutory approach whereby Congress would explicitly acknowledge that they have been and will in the future allow animals to be private property owners, or secondarily through a customary law approach, which essentially says what I said at the beginning, that we extinguish the rights of animals without knowing that we were doing so when we established the Anglo-American system of law in the United States. So under either a statutory approach or common law approach, this would essentially mean that animals have the right to own property. What does that look like in practice? Now this is the part that's always fun, right? Um, I've given this presentation a few times now. I've talked about co it with colleagues. I talk about it in sort of all my social situations as well. It turns out my manicurist has strong views on this informed by her dog ownership. Um, and it turns out that a lot of people have opinions about this. But if you envision what does it mean for animals to own property, one of my colleagues very seriously asked, so like would we have to put on antlers and fight with the deer in the field? <laughs> I said, I hadn't thought of that, but that sounds pretty great to me. I can imagine some reality TV show deriving from this in which the animals would get a percentage of the royalties. Um, not exactly what I'm proposing. My proposal is a bit more modest than us putting antlers on our head, but it's essentially humans holding in trust for animals this land. So the idea is that the humans would have to manage the land in accordance with the animal's best interest, which raises two issues. The first being, can humans truly determine animal's best interest, right? That's a real open question. And which humans would get to decide? And how would they get to decide? And would this be scientifically informed? The second question is essentially, um, what animals would you manage it for? What if there's an invasive species? What if there is one sort of charismatic megafauna everyone cares about, but there's a competing species that people think of as dirty or detrimental in some way that also has rights to the physical space? How would you manage it? 
And the answer is essentially a trust model. So America's had trust models for a really long time. It turns out that we allow ships and corporations to own property, right? So these inanimate objects have owned property for long periods of time. We know a lot about trust law, about how uh, trustees are allowed to discern for people who are not able to make decisions on their own, their best interests, and the courts are expert in evaluating that. That being said, I think there's a role in this model for uh, the existence of a certifying body, so a public-private body that would be comprised primarily of biologists or scientific experts with an animal expertise that would provide some sort of uniform standard by which all animal trustees would have to operate. So you would have both the individual trust law, which is established in every state, but then also the background private governance model of a certifying regime where there's a body of people who are ensuring that trustees are in fact active acting in the animal's interests instead of in human interests uh, for animals. The question of how to manage these animal interests is also an interesting one, right? So in my model, I envision an ecosystem level approach. So instead of managing the animal-owned lands for any particular species, you would instead look at the ecosystem as a whole. The idea that no single species would be necessarily prioritized above those of other species, but you would instead want sort of the natural approach to the landscape it raises numerous questions that are well beyond the scope of this project or frankly what a legal scholar alone should take on about how one would determine those ecosystems questions but it does suggest that things like prioritizing any single animal are problems that could be worked out if applied through this model by the trustees operating against the backdrop of both law but then also the scientific expertise so that's basically the sketch of the project. I'll now delve into three of the sort of strands that I think are more interesting. Um, the first of which is the idea of the history of animal ownership in the United States, the historical development. You may have noticed when I started talking about the role of animals in our society, I said sort of the mainstream American approach, but that's not the only American approach. America is a pluralistic society. There's no one uniform way in which we view, frankly, anything. But it turns out that in pre-colonial America, Native American land values, property values, were the dominant model. And although there's great diversity in the ways that various tribes conducted their affairs um, or envisioned their system of property rights, most indigenous systems acknowledge that humans are either not direct owners of land or that animals and other living things have an equal right to that land. The idea essentially being that humans are not allowed total and full dominion, but instead interact with other species on a landscape, each of whom has a right to be there. So if we take this to be true, this idea that humans shared the landscape with animals or that animals had a functional property right or property interest under indigenous models, we can then see that when the United States uh, Supreme Court decided Johnson versus McIntosh and these other famous cases expropriating land from Native Americans, they not only diminished the property rights of Native Americans, they also simultaneously and unwittingly extinguish the property rights of animals and other living things to the landscape, right? Because in the Western conception, the Anglo-Saxon conception, there was no role for living things to have this, this right to the landscape on which they were living, in which they were breeding, in which case they were eating and having their sort of day-to-day -day affairs fold out. There was no conception that that could exist. And so when the Supreme Court rid of sort of the Native American property system as the dominant system in the United States governing this American landscape, it also simultaneously wiped out this entire suite of rights it didn't realize existed in the first place. So this is one argument that perhaps historically animals have had property rights in the United States and perhaps they were done away with, if you will, without even recognition of what was happening. Now the funny thing is that you cannot do away with animals' right to land without functionally killing the wildlife. And it turns out that people innately like wildlife. In every history of the U.S. government, you see legislatures at the state and federal level working to protect wildlife interests. How does one protect wildlife interests? The dominant mechanism is to create or preserve habitat. The best way to save wildlife is to have a place for it to live. 
And over time in America, although this wasn't true in the very early history, over time in America, it became very clear that land development and human increased human encroachment into what were historically wildlife areas was the dominant cause of habitat loss in the United States. Right? So because the land uh, on which animals could live was progressively shrinking, wildlife was increasingly forced to smaller areas, which led to the diminishment and extinction of some species. So in order to combat this, you have very early examples from the 1800s onwards of legislatures acting to protect land and therefore protect wildlife. Theodore Roosevelt was a famous conservationist on this front, and he and subsequent presidents set aside many different uh, forms of public land that were in fact operating for wildlife. In fact, it turns out that over 100 million acres in the United States are managed for wildlife interests in the form of U.S. wildlife refuges. Now some people say, but wait, people can go onto those refuges. So really they're being managed for people who like to take photographs of the birds who land in these public lands, etc. But it turns out that if you look at the Organic Act or charters of many of these public lands, in fact the wildlife interests are a primary driving and sometimes sole reason why public lands are created. My favorite example if someone says, you know, is there really an example of Congress giving land to animals is that the prior horses have 30,000 acres in Montana. Montana. Very few people have 30,000 acres in Montana, but it turns out that Congress felt that these horses deserved this area. And so even though some of the wildlife refuges or national parks or other public lands are managed concurrently for human and animal interests, I think it's quite relevant that animals are part of the calculus that Congress is creating public rights to animals. And in fact, sometimes those rights are so strong that they're stronger than humans' rights to their own property. So various animals receive specialized protection, wild horses, I mentioned eagles. It turns out that if you own a piece of property that has a tree on it, and a bald eagle lands on that tree and makes a nest, the eagle then has a superior property right to that tree to you. You can't cut it down, you can't disturb it, you can't get rid of the nest. The eagle can be there as long as it wants to be and there's nothing you can do about it. They're not messing around, Congress, when they said it. It turns out that there's a story of a man in, I believe it was upstate New York. The New York Times reported on this. It was a fascinating story. Uh, there was a man who owned a lake, a small private lake on his property. And there were a number of birds who liked to use the lake for fishing. And he was quite upset that the birds were encroaching on his family's private lake. And he would get quite upset at the birds and yell at them and tell them to go away, that sort of thing. You know, typical behavior, right? Yelling at birds. And so <laughs> eventually, um, he became so mad at the birds that his neighbor heard shots fired. And she witnessed the man who had shot one of the birds pull out his forerunner and run over it repeatedly until it was dead. Um, this is all alleged, I can't say that I was there, but it's based on newspaper reports. Apparently U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did an autopsy on the bird uh, that confirmed that it had been killed by blunt force trauma, i.e. something consistent with a four-wheeler running over the bird, um, and the man was charged with violating this federal law because he'd not only killed an endangered species, but it was a particularly protected um, bird. He said the worst thing wasn't even the federal charges in a newspaper account, but the hate mail that he and his family received from members of the American public. So when we think about property rights and what gives rise to property and who in America can own property and how do we establish property, there are all of these different mechanisms, some of which I'll get into in a moment, but it's hard to envision a situation in which a landowner can't drive another person off of his property. And yet this man, in trying to drive the bird away and eventually killing it, went to great lengths to try to establish the superior property right. So kind of one very compelling example of this situation which occurs again and again. Now, it's interesting to think about the reasons why someone wouldn't want wildlife on their land. And in any individual case, it's really, really strong, right? Depending on the creature that's on your land, if it's an endangered species, there's widespread, albeit empirically in untrue, but widespread perception that having an endangered species on your property is going to diminish your land value. 
It will increase the potential for federal control on your land, and it will lessen the chance that you'll be able to sell your land quickly in the future should you want to, as well as commercial development. So those are the fears that landowners have about sharing their land with wildlife and specifically endangered species. But except for this very narrow category of endangered species, for much of American history, landowners are able to exclude wildlife from their land, including killing them, fencing them out, etc. So what has happened over time is that wildlife habitat has increasingly shrunk as human populations have grown and urban land patterns have become suburban in nature, building into areas that were previously wild and wildlife habitat. Nevertheless, animals remain, right? There are urban animals. Things like pigeons and rats in New York City are also sharing geographic space with humans today. And yet the law has no conception of this. It turns out, however, if you do a careful reading, you find examples like those that I've shown that have some indications that perhaps animals do have legally recognized rights to the space. The second rationale for animals having rights to the space is for a biological one. So it is a reality that we humans are animal. It is a reality that we share this earth with other living things. One reality that is incredibly well recognized among biologists and virtually unknown to legal scholars or perhaps the American public in general is that animals practice what is essentially systems of property. This is animal territoriality. It has long been accepted by biologists since 1930 or so that animal territoriality is essentially the same as property rights, right? The systems are very, virtually parallel. All of the things that we say are necessary in order to have property rights are true with animals with the potential um, restriction on alienation. I'm not aware of birds having real estate agents, but when we think about the defining features of property, things like how one acquires property, if one is able to exclude others from property, if there are rules or social norms regarding what it means to own property, these all exist among animals. So in a recent paper, I detail an overview of over 100 studies, scientific studies, of animal territoriality and map that on to human systems of property. Now I want to be clear, this is not an exhaustive account. I'm intentionally cherry picking my examples so that it tracks in ways that are easily recognizable. I don't claim that this is um, comprehensive or that any single animal species practices a system of property identical to that of humans. But at the same time, the similarities are striking. So for example, acquisition. So among humans, it's pretty clear that possession is a large part of the law. If I'm holding something, you likely aren't going to take it from me, even if I don't technically own it. Interestingly, it turns out that primates have very similar rules, right? Other creatures, if one is holding something, tend to believe that that animal has an exclusive right to it. And there have been some fascinating studies about animals um, recognizing possession of objects or chattel held by other animals as being the property of another animal. That extends as well to physical space. So animals have well-defined territories. This has long been understood. What do I mean by a territory? I mean a space to which an individual animal or group of animals collectively claims ownership. Ownership functionally means a right to exclude others and the right to include members of that group. And so animals have remarkably sophisticated systems of boundary marking, for example, which is a form of exclusion. It turns out, for example, that wild dogs use urine scent to mark their boundaries, which in some ways are even more sophisticated than our fences, because another dog coming along the scent-based boundary can discern the age of the animal, its health, its fitness, these things that you would want to know if you were calculating whether to contest the property claim of another creature. In addition to the boundary marking, which is quite sophisticated, and you see among creatures of all different sizes and varieties, um, you also have boundary protection. So we think about this sort of wildlife channel, animals fighting to the death being the mechanism of resolution, but it turns out that's not tremendously uh, evolutionary efficient. If we were all killing each other every time we decided to go to sleep, it wouldn't work out so well for our species. And so it turns out that like humans, Animals have developed rules for conflict resolution regarding property that don't result in the death. And these rules are fascinating, maybe my favorite uh, part of the research. So for example, fish race 
If two fish are competing over a spot in the stream, whomever is faster in a set race gets the property. Spiders bounce up and down on the web, and the strength of vi the vibration allows the spider to assess the strength of its competitor so they can decide whether or not a fight is worth it. You have countless examples from different species in which animals are essentially engaging in contests that are ritualized aggression that are designed to allow property disputes to resolve without requiring fight to the death matches. It turns out that in both people and, pro and animals, it is almost, although not universally true, that whomever possesses the property, the previous or the current inhabitant of the property, the person holding the pen or the landowner on the property, has a strong advantage if there is, in fact, a fight regarding the property. Um, but in most cases, there is no fight. The creatures merely figure it out through setting good boundaries and then enforcing them through ritualized dispute resolution, animals are able to enforce systems of property that look like humans. Now, interestingly, animals like people have at once public or communal property, not public, communal property and individual property. So, for example, in wolf behavior, you see that animals maintain or wolves maintain individual dens, family dwellings, which are contained within larger packs of wolves that have territorial hunting ground that operate at the communal level. Much like we might have an HOA in which our individual home resides, these animals are at once acting collectively to defend a larger space and then recognizing individual property within it. So interesting features, they look like animals have property, right? We have this exclusion, we have these boundary markers, we have acquisition and recognition that the possessor has a prior right to the property. It turns out there's also intergenerational transfer of property. So Jeffrey Stake was the first legal scholar to note this. He uh, compared property transfer rules, that is what happens to your property when you die, among humans to those of animals. And he found that intergenerational rules of transfer among birds essentially track some common law principles. I personally am really interested in the jaguar. It turns out we have a couple in Arizona, which I, as a native Californian, am fascinated in. Uh, this jaguar in Arizona. Um, and jaguars have really interesting property behavior. In fact, what started this whole project, I was reading a book in which I learned that jaguars build four to five foot mounds around the edges of their territory as territorial markers. And I remember jumping out of bed as I'm reading this and running across the room to my desk and writing down, the jaguars are making fences. They're creating property boundaries. And so I'm always interested in jaguar-based examples, which are particularly interesting with regard to inheritance or how they handle the intergenerational distribution of property. It turns out that the female jaguar, the mother, maintains the territory. While she's alive, her offspring, male and female, can live on it. When she dies, the female offspring divide the property and the male offspring have to get off of it. So interesting rule, when among humans we say that we have these property rules or sort of default rules regarding intergenerational transfer um, to resolve disputes or to avoid disputes before they come up, right? If there are clear rules, as in England, the eldest son gets the property, it becomes very clear to everyone in advance what the outcome will be and people can accord their, arrange their lives accordingly. From an evolutionary perspective, it turns out that animals are doing really similar things. These are a couple of examples, right? There are dozens, hundreds, that one can draw that are parallels between human and animal behavior. The interesting thing is some of the species of animals we consider less developed have the most sophisticated systems of property. Uh, so one of the fun things about being at a large university, and you share this at Vanderbilt, is you have a lot of interdisciplinary experts in different things. It turns out that I have a colleague at ASU who wrote the book, Ants! explanation mark. Uh, he is the world's foremost expert, as you might suspect, in ant behavior. And when I ran this theory past him for the first time several years ago, I was really nervous. I thought, is Bert going to think I'm crazy? So I went across campus and met with him and said, you know, I basically think animals have property and I've been reading these studies. Do you think there's anything to this? Could animals be operating at the sophistication of humans or near that with respect to property, right? And he goes, no, I don't think that's exactly right. And I thought, oh, there goes the theory. And he goes, animals are a lot more sophisticated in some cases compared to humans. He said ants have had, I forget his exact number, however million years to evolve, whereas humans have only had this amount. So in fact, 
Ants have much more sophisticated social systems, property rules, and systems of territoriality compared to humans. I can't assess if that's true. I don't have the scientific background, but he told a particularly compelling story about this strip in California that extends for miles and miles in which ants on both sides of the strip respect the territorial boundaries between two colonies. But there is a small disputed area between the two boundaries in which the ants send soldier ants, if you will, and kill each other on an ongoing basis over this tiny disputed area that extends for a very, very large distance. So essentially, much like some human conflicts around borders, you see these animals uh, competing over the shared space. So interesting to think about uh, some of the parallels. I want to warn, however, where the parallels start, because there's always this danger in has historically been a danger uh, when legal scholars or social experts begin to look at the biological similarities between humans and animals, and I want to be really clear what I'm not doing. One of the things I'm saying is that there is a universality of property systems. I'm not saying that any system is better or worse. I'm not saying there's a hierarchy of systems. I'm saying that it appears that humans share animal systems. This is in no way designed to create divisions among different groups of humans or classifications of better or worse systems. I think that's precisely the opposite of what this project is doing. I'm in fact saying there's commonality here among all living things and humans are operating as one creature within this broad and diverse system of property rights. So I want to be really clear what I'm not saying because there have been scary implications drawn from the use of biology in the past and my project's in fact the opposite of what those things are trying to say. It's more universalist in nature. Um, so one of the interesting things when we start to think about the ways in which animals and humans correspond in property rights is it's not just animals and humans, it's starting to look like it's all living things. So I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but it turns out that trees are suddenly making a splash on the New York seller list. There was a novel about trees a colleague recently gave me called Overstory, 500 pages. Uh, there's a, another book I read by a German forester a few years ago, was it The Secret Life of Trees? Uh, which talks about trees communicating with one another, and that spurred me to look first into trees and then at the suggestion of a cousin at um, sociomicrobiology. So it turns out that plants enforce territoriality and even bacteria enforce territorial behaviors. So there's an increasing awareness that on several different levels, plants, animals, bacteria, ecosystems as a whole, you see property behaviors in this sort of nested system. Okay, this is interesting. It's a fun party trick to tell people that ants are like people with respect to animal behavior. But what purchase does it have? What kind of legal outcomes might it produce? Or why should it shift the way we think? Well, if this is true, we're again confronted with the same question that arose from the example of destroying indigenous rights in the United States or extinguishing indigenous rights and concurrently getting rid of animal rights without being aware that we're doing so. Humans and law tend to operate as though we are different, distinct, removed from animal interests. And yet in law, in property law, in natural resources, environmental law, land use law, we are interacting with both a living, flexible, natural, geographic area, but also with all other living things within that area. And once we're confronted with biological information about how species and interspecies disputes around property operate, it begs the legal question, why are we operating under this fiction that only humans can own property? Biologically, we know animals own property under virtually any definition that we use for humans. So why in law do we refuse to recognize that this is true? The answer in part is, well, in some ways we've gotten around this without having to acknowledge it by just giving animals property. And I think that's mattered a lot. One of the dominant accounts in the United States for why we've seen a slowing of endangered species over time is because of the Endangered Species Act of the 1970s. A competing account that I think deserves some attention is that no, in fact, it's the American public land system, the fact that one third of our country is owned by the federal government, which manages some of its lands for animals, that has increasingly become wildlife habitat and protected wildlife species. But with the renewed calls for divesting public lands or privatizing public lands in the United States, there's a need to think about other avenues to protecting wildlife. Also, scholars differ on their assessment of the efficacy of the Endangered Species Act, particularly with regard to the critical habitat designation. 
So if that's true, anyone who's concerned about the existence or maintenance of wildlife over time should begin to look at alternate approaches. Certainly conservationists have done this. Ted Turner has famously uh, purchased land for bison. We have other animal activists who've purchased large swaths of land for various species, but that land presently is held for humans. So in this project, I think about what would it look like if we in fact had animal-owned property. I discussed briefly, and I won't reiterate, sort of the way in which this would function. Human managed trusts on behalf of animals. What I will say is there are basically two approaches one could take to this, one being the statutory approach, if Congress were to act in this way, the other being the common law approach based on a legal argument I won't get into here. If you're interested, it's in my paper in Colorado Law Review, um, looking at the ways in which we could argue that animal property ownership already exists and the court should recognize it. Now this, started sound, this sounded far-fetched, perhaps, at the start of this project, but it turns out there are active and live legal arguments happening in this. So if you're familiar with the monkey selfie case, uh, there is a primate, in fact not a monkey, but a primate of a different variety who took a selfie portrait or took a picture of itself on a tripod that a British wildlife photographer had set up. Um, and the photographer sold the picture and collected the royalties. PETA filed a lawsuit saying, no, the monkey owned the selfie. He created that. And so it turned out that the lower court said, you know, certainly Congress could create animal property rights under a copyright statute or otherwise, but it hasn't. And so that we can't recognize that the monkey owns the selfie. This was shocking in some ways, right? A lot of people read that as the monkey doesn't own the selfie. Animal activists read that as Congress can create property rights for animals. Uh, so a very interesting, different way to look at it. Ultimately, the case went up to Ninth Circuit, to the Ninth Circuit. Um, the various sides argued, but ultimately settled the case after oral arguments. Interestingly, though, the Ninth Circuit nevertheless issued an opinion in which Judge Bay, authoring the opinion, said that the Ninth Circuit had previously recognized that animals had standing to sue. Now this is interesting, right? Article 3 standing under the Constitution, there was a case with Bush and then another um, case with a Hawaiian bird, I'm forgetting the name, but a couple of cases in the Ninth Circuit that had either accepted unquestioningly or acknowledged that animals could sue. The question then becomes who can sue on behalf of the animals. Judge Bay found that PETA was probably not the right friend to this monkey, selfie-taking monkey, um, but acknowledged that Congress could specify other potential litigants on behalf of animals. So that's the state of affairs. Uh, Judge Bay essentially called for the Ninth Circuit to reconsider its position in the Bush case um, and to overturn that precedent so that there was no longer the right for animals to sue. Since then, a lower court in Oregon has found that animals do not have the right to sue. But it remains a live legal issue, and the law in the books in the Ninth Circuit appears to be that animals have legal standing. So that's sort of the modern state of affairs, but also animal property rights. Another colleague once suggested this is different than the deer antler example, but another creative idea, and I love the diversity of ideas that people have brought with this. Well, what if animals got a royalty every time they were mentioned in a book, or their picture was used in a car advertisement, or a football team used them on their jersey? Interesting. Right? There are a lot of variations on this. I can't claim that I'm advocating for them, but it's interesting to think about the ways that we use animals for human property interests without compensating them. So ultimately, the aim of this project and eventual book is to consider a very radically different approach to animal rights, if you will, to the welfare of animals, to the how animals are treated by humans. It has advantages and disadvantages. This doesn't do anything to help monkeys who are used for research or kept in caves, in caves, in cages. This does very little for livestock that are treated poorly. Those are different fights, and there are people fighting those fights. But what my project aims to do is to find a legal mechanism by which we can help wildlife and by which we can more accurately reflect the place that humans do in fact play in the natural environment. This could take many forms. This is just a first sort of stake in the ground for the idea from a legal perspective. It could take the form of an animal interest in all property rights. Right, so that every human right is in some way constrained to allow for wildlife interest. It could result in literal animal ownership of property in the way envisioned in the Colorado paper. It could take forms I've not yet imagined.
But with this, I hope to start a conversation, which I think and hope that many other people will weigh in on. And I want to highlight it as an alternative to this sort of rights welfare paradigm in which animal advocates have long been lost. I think there are a number of creative mechanisms that we can take collectively to think about animal welfare, the treatment of animals in our society. And I would encourage you, to the extent that you're interested, to think outside the boxes that currently exist and construct novel legal arguments for ways in which we can reshape our society to better incorporate the role of animals. Thank you. Great. I'm open to questions if anyone has them. Yes. Yeah, so I guess uh, you were talking a little bit about the ecosystem of you. Um, you briefly touched on trees and then going down to bacteria. So I guess <coughs> would those uh, life forms as well be considered within this paradigm? Do you feel like there needs to be a different paradigm to address kind of the flora uh, instead of the fauna, how would those two interact? Great question. So if we acknowledge that bacteria and plants have systems of territoriality, shouldn't my paper really be all living things have property rights instead of animal rights? I think actually that would be the correct and eventual outcome of this line of thinking, is to understand that all living things operate in shared geographic space and accommodating their differing needs simultaneously is a requirement for us as humans, right? And it turns out that that approach is in some ways very much grounded in traditional thinking in a number of religious views. Um, it's something that modern mainstream American society has largely walked away from, but as a traditional practice of humans on Earth that has been true across time, culture, and place. So I would advocate for returning to that view. I absolutely think that the all living things perspective is a more holistic and accurate approach. Um, I think incrementally from a pragmatic view, starting with animals and building out from there is one pathway forward. It's easier to um, help people understand the ways in which creatures that are familiar, other mammals, have interactions with physical space. And perhaps that leads to the acceptance of that idea with respect to animals, which can then expand. The more challenging question for me in some ways is artificial intelligence, right? So a lot of people who encounter this idea say, where do you draw the line? Should rocks have property rights? Should uh, robots have property rights? Where do you draw the line? In my personal worldview, it stops at living things uh, who are part of a natural ecosystem. I think that's a fairly bright line. I don't think there are strong arguments that I've encountered, although I think they could be made about why the living nature of things are in fact the drawing line. I know that people, including one of the students at ASU, is arguing on behalf of artificial intelligence having property rights. That's not part of my argument. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so it's interesting. This is a newer project for me. I've never taught animal law. I'm maybe three years into this project. So it's not something that I've been doing for a long time, and I'm still working out exactly where this fits in the broader animal law community. So I want to situate this by saying I'm coming from a very humble place of being new to this. Um, and so I very much welcome critique ideas, variations, the ability to see issues that I haven't seen. The way I envision this project going is I feel like I found this ball and I want to throw it up in the air and hope that people play with it. Does that make sense? So whether they're critiquing it, attacking it, supporting it, building upon it, I think that just starting the conversation is my primary aim. And from there, there are numerous iterations. So you mentioned the wild horse example. I'm co-authoring a paper right now that talks about wildlife habitat and specifically unpacks the uh, conflict and interest between wild horse advocates and cattle grazers with respect to grazing rights or forage rights on federal public lands. And that's a tiny microcosm 
of this much broader issue, and yet it's unbelievably complicated, right? So unpacking this in some sort of systematic way is beyond the life work of what I could do, certainly over the course of a career. But my sincere hope is throwing up the ball will open the door to many people uh, at least engaging with the idea. Maybe you? <laughs> Hopefully. Yes. Uh, first of all, really fascinating. Thank and you. I think Ms. Holder can attest to this. We in our environmental law and policy annual review class look at every article that's been written on the environmental legal literature every year. And we wow. have very few new ideas. So <laughs> Thank I mean, you. it's really fun and exciting to hear of a new idea. And I actually encourage you to well, I have, I have numerous, numerous questions about this, okay. um, but um, I, I would like to say, like, how are you conceptualizing first, how it fits, is this, is this property law, is this environmental law, like kind of what box you mean, I think that will have a big effect on how much attention it gets and how it moves forward, I encourage you to think of it in, under the environmental umbrella in part, um, because I think that it will get a lot of attention, there's been so much synergy in recent years, you know, between animal law and, um, and environmental law. So, well, that's the first part of my question. Then I have some follow-up. Great. Well, thank you. I have to say, um, situating this project has been interesting because I started with what I thought was a property law paper, and it very quickly became clear that it was something else. The animal law community, as soon as I sent it um, to one of the leaders within that community, reached out to me and embraced this project, and I'm incredibly grateful that they have. I see one of the aims of this project is to erase what I believe to be artificial distinctions between these different fields. So if you think about land use, property, natural resources, environmental law, and animal law, those are different areas. In many cases, you have people who write in one area and not others. Not universally, many people do multiple areas, but few people do all of the areas. And I remember when I was on the job market, someone said, so you kind of seem all over the place. You know, I see land use, I see real estate, I see some natural resources stuff. How do you explain that? And I said, I think they're all connected. I think it's all one system. I think we're talking about different parts of the system. So for example, you could see environmental law as being the externalities of land use that property scholars don't want to talk about. And it becomes very convenient to subdivide the fields and have different ideological identities associated with different fields when in fact they are all connected. So to this end, I'm uh, organizing a panel at the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation Natural Resources Law Professor Teacher Institute. <laughs> you should hear the acronym for it. It's not pretty. Uh, but I'm organizing a panel there that's precisely designed to get animal law scholars in front of a room of natural resource scholars uh, so that those two fields can intersect on these ideas because I think natural resources folks, public lands folks, um, are aware of animal issues, have incredibly interesting and important things they could say, but have maybe not fully engaged in the theoretical exercise of doing so. And I would love to see that connection be made. I think there's so much intellectual firepower in environmental law, in natural resources law, that could very easily be turned to animal law issues if it wasn't seen as another field. Yeah, absolutely. We struggle with that even just with our environment. Interesting. Oh, so that is a great, great idea. So I did one tiny piece of state statute work here. I think there is endless work that could be done on the subject. But one of the things that really interested me when I'm making the argument that there is, in fact, a system of animal property law is that in the last two decades, most American states have enacted codes that allow pets to inherit from their human owners through the uniform property of uniform probate, I'm forgetting the name, but there's a uniform code for property law, trusts and estates, and that uniform code contained this provision which was then adopted by the majority of states. So in most states, your pet can inherit your property as a matter of state law, which is incredibly progressive if you think about it, and a sweeping transformation that frankly very few people noticed. Um, and so there's reason to think that states might be progressive on certain animal issues. There are also state uh, fish and game and wildlife agencies. Dean Luke, a resource economist, has done some recent work on this, um, thinking about the way that those intersect with wildlife interests. But I think it's interesting, I think it's important, and in fact, most wildlife issues as a constitutional matter reside at the state level. So. We're just 
United States are also, you know, right to hunt, constitutional right yeah. to hunt. You know, I mean, it's interesting how the idea of animal having property rights interfaces or coexists with the right of humans to own animals, right? Oh, certainly to own animals and to hunt animals. And that's one of the main, you could say, critiques of this project, is that it does nothing on those questions in either directions. In fact, it turns out sportsmen's groups give a lot of money to wildlife habitat preservation. A lot of money. On the other hand, some people who identify as strong animal advocates can't imagine that partnership. So it's an interesting tension there. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Contract law with your thesis, yeah. since I would think that an artificial intelligent robot is more likely to understand, offer, and accept a property transfer as opposed to any animals like a deer or a, or an ant. Um, so, like, yeah, how do you square off contract law with your thesis, or is it just outside the scope? No, no. Let's talk about it. So, tell me what you're saying when you're saying con property laws become more contractual. In part because I'm teaching property for the first time this semester, so I'm like, what should I be teaching that I am not teaching? Um, yeah. Part of the equation. So first of all, good luck on the bar. <laughs> um, secondly, it's interesting to think about, right? Because when we think about property law, I'm thinking of like lease agreements, sales agreements, those sorts of things. And certainly they're strongly contractual. I think one of the interesting things about contract is it's merely representing an agreement. Right? It's a formalized way to recognize an agreement between two people. Why do we have that agreement? Well, we have that agreement because two people are making an arrangement with respect to property rights. We're merely putting it in writing and formalizing it. But the agreement between two living things with respect to property rights, in some ways, is no different than the agreement that two and members of the same species make. So two birds deciding who gets a tree um, for a particular season, which it turns out, and I think I may have undersold it here, they do a surprising specificity and even if they migrate away they come back and it's the same tree unless someone's upgraded or died in which case there's a certain rule or order in which someone else a subsequent owner can take over that property etc so it's really sophisticated systems and I would say to the extent that property law is contractual it may just be reflecting what the agreements are between people and this is an even bolder position but one that I'm sort of playing with I'd be interested in your thoughts, but it's the idea that maybe property law is just a codification, us writing down biological principles of law. So it turns out that there are certain mathematical hypotheses about how animals share geographic space that are very well developed in the biological sense. So one is the resource distribution hypothesis, which says that both the number of animals of a particular species on a landscape and the social structure of those animals is dependent on the underlying resource conditions of the property. So if the uh, resource is patchy and spread out, the wolves are going to have a bigger territory. If the resources are clumped together and rich, they'll have a smaller territory. The best example I can think about this is I read a paper that described that every um, pride of lions must have two watering holes. It doesn't matter how far apart they are, but every pride of lions has two. They don't have one, they don't have three. And the reason why is they do prey kills at alternating watering holes. So they'll kill a, I don't know what they eat. Help me out, what do lions eat? Yes, okay, so they'll eat an antelope here, they'll eat an antelope there, and they alternate back and forth between kills. If they're limited for some reason to just one watering hole, um, they overexhaust the resource. If they try and do too many, they then are exhausting themselves. So the distance between these watering holes essentially determines the size of the pride of lions. And it turns out that this hypothesis has been used and applied to all different kinds of species. And they say that the rules or behaviors or social norms that develop among species 
species, in fact, depend heavily on the underlying resource conditions. So there are two very biologically similar primates that had different kinds of food or vegetation available, and they've developed in almost tremendously or almost um, opposite ways with respect to property rules, just as a function of the food. The resource distribution hypothesis is so strong that some scientists use it to explain why dinosaurs became so big. Right, so this is an incredibly well-tested, well-vetted model within the biological literature, not universally accepted, but well accepted by many leading scholars, and yet it's not something we've ever thought about with respect to human property. I think it looks as though there was an article in Science that was very good that said that some of these rules that they've developed in uh, biological literatures, it turns out are true for people. So the ways in which certain towns are constructed or the distance between certain things are replicated in human behavior and animal behavior, and we're doing it unwittingly, right? So maybe this is, you know, just an idea, but maybe what we're doing with what we think of property law is we're just writing down the rules that are true for us and ants and lions too, right? Maybe we're just codifying and making rules designed uh, to capture these biologically ingrained notions, thinking we're creating them, but in fact responding to a biological impulse. And one way I always think of this, you know, we think like, oh, animals are so violent in how they defend their property. Is anyone familiar with the castle doctrine? <laughs> Stand your ground laws, right? In a majority of U.S. states, you can kill someone for walking onto your land. Yes? So this makes sense to me, the way, you know, that we're looking at the way humans interact with each other property-wise and how different species interact with each other property-wise, but how do the property rights between different species interact with each other? That is one thing I haven't heard at all so far. Yeah, well, and part of the reason it's a great question is because I haven't read much about it. Yeah. Um, so there is some discussion in what I've read about the intersection between different species property regimes, but it's really limited. So either there's a part of the literature to which I haven't yet tapped into, or it's an underdeveloped area of the literature. Anecdotally, based on what I've seen, most of the biologists who are writing in this area tend to have a species specialization, as with ants, and so they tend to write a lot about a particular, uh, like birds or insects. Um, so the cross-species comparisons of territoriality usually speak to these mathematical models and say like, oh look, it is true for badgers and it isn't true for beetles and that sort of thing, but I've seen less on interspecies interactions. That being said, anecdotally, people have been saying forever that they exist, right? Um, and the interesting thing to me is, are there well-developed mathematical models for how those play out? Because if there are, you would want to use them for the governance mechanism that you're embedding in these animal-owned trusts. I haven't seen much about it, but uh, one of Jack Stake's examples is there was an ornithologist, a bird researcher, uh, who was studying different property behaviors, and the birds just ran him out of the area he was trying to study, and he was unable to complete the study in that area because the birds asserted a superior property right. So there is this question of interspecies disputes. I think it's fascinating, and I don't know the answer. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much.